Hello, if you watch this channel, you know that we like old things. But today we are going to talk about really old things. We are visiting scientists at the University of California, Berkeley. Life scientists, to be exact. But more exactly, those that study ancient life, the life that was here long, long before us. It all started with an email entitled Paleontological Data Fossilized on IBM 8-inch Floppies. It was from a French and a Dutch scientist, Antoine and Cindy. Dear Curious Mark, it said, we are both paleobotanists. They went on to explain that they stumbled on what may be important fossil data from an old IBM mainframe of all things. It turns out they study plants that lived an astounding 300 million years ago in a period called the Carboniferous. Now that's old. Fortunately, the 8-inch floppies aren't quite that old but they were probably run on an IBM 360 or 370. Can we help them recover the data? You bet. Old enough for us. And that's how one of our most fascinating retro computing adventures started. Alright. Welcome. Hi, Cindy. Welcome. Mark. How are you? Good. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Oh. Yeah. Of course. Now, ah. <laughs> Uh, we, we have to replay it because we met before, right? But uh, tell us a little bit about what you, what the research you did and uh, how you came to me. Yes, we're working on material from the Carboniferous. So um, the Carboniferous was a time period over 300 million years ago. Uh, and during that time period, you had these widespread coal swamps in what is now Euro America, or what was then called Euro America is now Europe and America. So, so uh, hold on a second. So the, yeah. the the, the land was different, Yes. and the weather was different too, Yes, right? so you had um, the connected Europe and American uh, continents in, in Euro-America, and you had uh, a very interesting climatological period where you had these glacial and interglacial cycles. So you had periods of ever wet, which actually occurred during these glacial cycles, and during those time periods, you had these huge widespread swamps in Euro-America. So ever wet means it rained, rained all the time? All the time. Yeah, so this is a reconstruction of what one of those late Pennsylvanian swamp forests might have looked like. So you have the swamp, you have reptilians, so no mammals, right? At that time, they didn't exist yet. No, mammals did not exist yet. And there is a little tiny lizard sitting on the trunk of those big lycopod tree um, and here are uh, really big um, insects, gigantic dragonflies, dragonflies flying around. And they were like uh, a you know, foot long or something like that? Well, their, their wing, wingspan was, um, I believe, at least two, up to two feet. So this surprised me. This is way more ancient than how we imagine prehistoric life, like what's depicted in Jurassic Park. Don't even think about mammals and birds, of course, but this is way, way before dinosaurs even existed. They wouldn't be around for another 150 million years. In fact, there were no herbivores, nothing that could eat plants at all besides insects, just reptilians and amphibians starting to colonize land. And even the tree and wood was a newfangled invention. And, and so, so plants grew like crazy and then they found a swamp and then they didn't decay or go back to the atmosphere as, as yeah, was in these supposed. swamps since there is so much moisture uh -huh. decay of organic matter that is being produced in the swamps by the swamp forests mm -hmm. uh, decay is really slowly below the water table so that means that you get a, a build-up of more and more organic matter uh, stacked on top of one another which is a peat uh -huh. basically we still have peats Nowadays, mm -hmm. but then they were just massive, Everywhere. covering large portions of, of of these two continents that were together in the in the giant continent called Pangaea. And eventually, if you wait long enough, that becomes it piles up, becomes coal over yep. hundreds of millions of yeah, years. Yeah, the peats are covered in sediments mm -hmm. and then are compressed and heated up a little bit, and the organ organic matter is transformed into coal. So it's largely com compressed, and in those coals that we dig up to burn uh, as fossil fuel nowadays, in those coals you can see very little of the actual plants that produced the coal, 
but fortunately in the coal before it was coal so still when it was still peaked sometimes you get these uh, uh, buildup of uh, carbonate nodules so they encase the organic matter the plant material that is there before it is being compressed and as these carbonate nodules have formed they are no longer compressible so in those carbonate nodules sitting in what is now coal we see the plant material still in its old uh, anatomical shape so to speak every little cell is preserved in those calcium carbonates and that's what you guys are studying and they're called coal balls right? coal, coal balls yeah. which are neither coal nor balls yes they're, <laughs> exactly. yeah, they're, they're not coals because they're peat and they're yeah. not balls because often they're just boulder shape yeah, irregular yeah so it's a slab here is a slice of what used to be a coal ball there's still some coal at the top and coal at the bottom and ah. the grayish part in between is actually the, the coal ball. So that's the, right. the calcium carbonate that holds the anatomically preserved plant. And, and you told me that the miners hate it because it breaks their tools? Or the miners did not like these coal balls because they're much harder than coal. If you've yeah. ever touched coal, you know that you if you just squeeze it a little bit, it huh? falls apart. This is as hard as a rock because huh? it is a rock. And it's limestone, so you cannot burn it. So it's it's annoying and it is uh, uh, worthless uh -huh. so what paleobotanists do is uh, if you have one of these coal balls you, you dip part of uh, the surface into uh, relatively m mild acids the limestone of that top layer is then gone the plant matter that is trapped in the coal ball is then sticking out and people then throw acetone over it and then put a peel of acetate on top of it. The organic matter will more or less melt into the plastic layer. And what you do then eventually is pull it off and a very thin layer of this coal ball is trapped in the acetate. And the structure. Yeah. Huh? So what people then do <coughs> is go to a microscope, put it under the microscope, and then you can try to see if you can recognize mm. What is what forms this coal ball? Mm -hmm. These things over here are rootlets of a lycopod that are uh, growing into the peat. Yeah, one of one of those uh, pre uh, trees that really are the, the highest ones in uh, in the swamp communities, uh -huh. and they have pretty specific roots. Now you can see what kind of detail is possible in these. And these peels, all these little tiny circles you're seeing are actually cells. So is this a fossil of cell that's 300 million years old? Yeah. So 300 million years old cells. So this is the vascular bundle inside the root. So this is where um, uh, water is being transported up from the roots to uh, the top of the plants so oh the whole this is the root yep and this is the vascular whatever yeah ah fine you can see the individual cells in the root pretty good mm -hmm. if that these what i just showed you are stigmarian rootlets i'm almost 100 percent sure but how come you find all that old data so this data set was generated by Professor Tom Phillips of the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and he started collecting coal balls at least as early as the 60s, probably before that, um, throughout Illinois and the rest of coal country in the U.S., so wherever you can imagine coal coming from. He built a warehouse to house these coal balls um, that's still there, and it has over 50,000 coal balls in it. Wow. And then over the next decades, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, and so forth, they sectioned these coal balls, as Cindy just described, and they examined them systematically. Uh, and not only could they identify what was in each square centimeter to the type of plant that you're looking at, so the genus and often the species, but they also uh, included information about the tissue that you're looking at. So, and so they did that 
centimeter by centimeter. So they would take one of these peels, let me hold mm -hmm. this up real quick, mm -hmm. and they would put just a centimeter square grid over it, and then for each square centimeter, they would go in the microscope and they would record what they saw. Mm -hmm. And they would then digitize these data on an IBM 360 mainframe computer. And so what this is telling you is actually what was present in this square centimeter. So you have a peel like this and you number the square centimeters, right? And so in this case up to at least 213. And then here you record the centimeter of interest, the genus, the P here, so I believe this is a type of Seronius, so that's a tree fern. And then after the period you have an eight, that refers to a specific species. And there's an index where you can look up exactly what species that was. ST just refers to stem, so this was stem material. Mm -hmm. And then they record more information about if this material was connected to other material. So th this is in the 60s, right? Had any this was done anything like that before? No, no one had ever done a sort of systematic or generated a systematic data set in paleobotany on this scale. Um, and, and even and less... no one has since. And even less using computers, right? And even less using computers, yes. Digitizing something like this in the, this would have started in the 70s, I believe, with the digitization and the IBM 360. Um, no one else had done that, yeah. Tom Phillips and his graduate students worked on this material, but uh, during the time when he was a professor, um, there were no computers or programs available where you could turn it into a gigantic data set. So they generated big data, but they couldn't analyze it. It was not yeah. possible to connect it. <laughs> And uh, Ben is interested in uh, the, the fire record that is locked in this uh, COBOL data set. So that's how we became uh, part of this redigitization uh, uh, process and this attempt to, to open up the, the data set to uh, the rest of the scientific community. So this incredibly tenacious professor kept using the system he had invented in the 1960s digitizing a prodigious 600,000 centimeter square of data, but lacking computer means to analyze it as a whole. This data set has been rediscovered recently after his death. First only thought to exist in the printouts, there were extensive efforts made to digitize it via OCR, and our very hands-on paleontologists made this very special table for this purpose. But OCR was working very poorly. That's when they discovered the 8-inch floppies. Then you, you wanted to scan it and it was pretty hard. And then eventually you found out that there were some disks that might have it right. already. Yeah. And they were the eight inch floppies. We visited the Tom Phillips lab again in Illinois. And Cindy stumbled upon in the back of the lab what she initially thought might be old VHS boxes. But then when we got up close, we saw that they were floppy disk boxes for really vintage eight inch floppy disks. And right away we saw that the markings on the outside of the boxes here, so that you can see here, this says uh, 11, that refers to the floppy disk, and then Sahara 4, part 2. Um, Sahara we recognize right away as being a locality, an area where cobalts were collected. And not only that, but a locality that we had data tomes for. We had these paper data sheets for. And so this overlap was immediately interesting. And then the floor will refer to a vertical section, so an area of collection, right? So these, this name is structured in the same way as the data in these data tomes. So right away we were very excited thinking that this might be a digital record um, that we thought had been completely lost or perhaps had never existed at all. And so that's when this sort of computer archaeology part kicked in. Well, we found these uh, floppy disks, I think, about five weeks ago. And um, a friend of us, um, Antoine Berkovici, he's also a paleobotanist who lives in Paris, <laughs> also knows a lot about um, all the computers. Within 10 minutes after discovering these floppy disks, I sent him a message mm -hmm. saying, uh, Hey Antoine, can you do something with this? So this is the famous Antoine whom I later visited in Paris. He is an amazing character, a paleobotanist, musician, collector of computer chips. He deserves an episode just by himself. But suffice to say, he watches the Curious Mark channel. And he immediately contacted 
um, you and from then it has been a roller co coaster of discovery and uh, yeah paleo data mining phew that was a lengthy introduction but I find what these guys can tease out of all stones about the history of Earth and our own life absolutely fascinating. Now that we know what we are looking for, we'll get into the retro computing work in the next episode. Oh, oh, it's reading our data. data. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that's that.